Hello everyone. I'm back with another tale from many moons ago. Things have changed so much. Or have they? First let me tell you, some words in this story are going to be old-fashioned and raw. We need to all be aware of the feel at the time so we can understand better. We are so out of touch, really, with how things were because we weren't even alive, right? Makes sense to me. Virginia Christian's murder of her employer, Ida Bloat, was described by Governor William Hodges' man as the most dastardly in the state's history and that Christian's execution was necessary to ensure public safety. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of Ida and Virginia, who they call Jenny, and you can decide what you think. I never take sides in these stories, as I believe these old stories and even new ones are so twisted sometimes by the time that they become a story that it's hard to really know what happened. I also think that you can't decide if someone is guilty or innocent just because of their station in life or their race or gender or even their intentions, which in this case, Virginia didn't hide what she did. Everyone is different, period. Every race and gender simply has good and bad people. It's called being humans. We are all part of the human race. So we tend to follow a certain makeup. So let's go back to 1912 for a while and visit a little town in Virginia. On a sweltering August afternoon in 1912, the quiet town of Hampton, Virginia, buzzed with an unusual excitement. Word had spread about a particular event scheduled for the following morning, and the local general store had run out of copies of the newspaper detailing the grim story. The tale of Ida Below and Virginia Christian had become the talk of the town, and the townsfolk had split into two distinct factions. Some believed Christian side of the story that she had acted in self-defense against the tyrannical Ida. Others were convinced that Christian had maliciously taken advantage of a misunderstanding to claim her mistress's possessions for herself. At the age of 13, Virginia dropped out of Hampton Witter Training School to work as a laundress for Mrs. Ida Virginia Below. And yes, Ida's middle name was Virginia and they both lived in Virginia. Now, Virginia, we'll call her Jenny from here on out because that's what she went by, was a 17-year-old washerwoman in 1912. She'd been with Ida for about four years at this time. Ida Below, 51, was one of Hampton's aristocracy by the way of her father's prominence as the owner of a large grocery. News accounts described her as weighing only 91 pounds, a frail, delicate widow. On the fateful morning of the confrontation, Jenny had arrived at the below residence to collect her weekly laundry. The air was thick with tension as she stepped into the kitchen, her eyes avoiding the cold gaze of Ida, who sat at the table, a stern look etched into her face. The room was filled with an aroma of freshly brewed coffee, yet the atmosphere was anything but welcoming. Jenny, Ida began, her voice cutting through the air like a knife. I found my locket missing and my favorite skirt. Did you take them? Her accusation hung in the air. The two then got into a violent argument, one that only Jenny and Ida really know what happened. Ida was known to frequently beat and break Jenny, and on the 18th of March, 1912, Ida threw a clay pot at Jenny, hitting her on the shoulder. When it fell and shattered, Ida then threw the broken pieces at Jenny. The next item Ida attempted to retrieve to use as a weapon was a nearby broom. However, Jenny managed to grab it before she could get to it and cracked Ida over the head. Ida started to scream, and in an attempt to muffle her screams, Jenny shoved a towel in Ida's mouth, causing her to suffocate. She also had severe head injuries. The police found Ida laying face down in a pool of her own blood. Jenny did little to cover up her crime, and she confessed soon after she was arrested. In the local press of the time, 
Jenny Christian was described as, first sentence, I really can't even say, kinky hair done up in threads with dark, lusterless eyes and with splotches on the skin of her face. Her color is dark brown, her figure short, dumpy, and squashy. She has had some schooling, but her speech does not betray it. Newspapers quoted Virginia's confession like this. Now, I'm just going to read this normal because the way that it's actually wrote up, for one, it's hard to follow. And for two, it's just not a way that I really feel comfortable talking. So I'm just going to read it like a normal person. Okay, what she said was this, that she, meaning Ida, came to her mammer's house that morning, came to her mom's house that morning, and said she wanted me to come over and do some wash. When I came home, my mom said that Miss Below want me, and I went around to the house. I went in the back way, and when she saw me, she asked me about a gold locket she missed. I told her I ain't seen anything. She also said something about a skirt, but the main thing was the locket. She said, yes, you got it, and if you don't bring it back, I'm going to have you put in jail. I got mad and told her if I did have it, she wasn't going to get it back. Then she picked up a spittoon and hit me with it, and it broke. There was two sticks in the room, two broom, broom handles. She ran for one, and I ran for the other. I got my stick first, and I hit her with it on the side of the head, and she fell down. She kept hollering, so I took a towel and stuffed it in her mouth. I held it there till she quit hollering, and then she just groaned. I didn't mean to kill her, and I didn't know that I had. I was mad when I hit her, and when I stuffed a towel in her mouth to keep her from hollering. I never meant to kill her. When I left, she was groaning and laying on her back. So as you can see, there's a little bit of difference between what she actually said and what the newspapers reported, um, but they're just little details that really don't make a difference, like both of them running for the same broomstick versus both of them running for two different brooms, etc. Her mother wrote a pleading letter to Governor William Hodges' man in which she pleaded for her daughter's life. The letter went like this. My dear Mr. Governor, please forgive me for bothering you. I have been paralyzed for more than three years and I could not look after Jenny as I wanted to. I know she done an awful wicked thing when she killed Mrs. Belote, and I hear that people at the penitentiary want to kill her, but I am praying night and day on my knees to God that he will soften your heart. If you only save my child who is so little, God will bless you forever. Jenny was tried less than two weeks after her murder. In the months running up to her execution, Governor Mann received hundreds of letters from people expressing their outrage at the execution. Her attorney wrote, Great throngs of people, far more than could be accommodated in this courtroom, pressed for entrance to the trial, and the feeling manifested was intense. After Governor Mann refused to stop the execution, E. Val Putnam, a newspaper editor for the Chicago Evening World, sent a telegram to him expressing his outrage that Jenny's race, gender, and youth were all irrelevant. Some believed there was a fear of what could happen if Jenny was found not guilty or if she had spoke on the stand about the abuse. Jenny was not allowed to testify. Even if Jenny had not been brought to trial, if there had been no trial, probably she would have been tried by the community in one way or another, maybe hauled out and lynched, maybe just run out of town. The state of Virginia is only the second behind Texas in executions, and five months after the crime, Jenny was executed. Her execution fell on the day after her 17th birthday. She spent a restful night sleeping as though she were at peace with the world. She ate her breakfast of rolls, eggs, and coffee before being escorted to the electric chair. The 17-year-old was led to her death in the state penitentiary at 7.25 in the morning, read the news leader. Jenny's electric chair was built in 1908. In the years around 1912, the procedure of electrocution was still under development. The electrodes were attached to Jenny's forearms instead of her head and legs. A reporter that witnessed the execution went on to say this, the usual three shocks were administered by the officer in charge of the electric current. 
Each time the electric switch was touched, the body of the woman responded with fearful convulsion. Death, it is believed, was pretty instant. The paper reported that Jenny's body was to be turned over to the state medical school because her parents did not have the money to transfer her body from Richmond, Virginia. But according to this newspaper article, that wasn't the case. Virginia Christian buried yesterday, many attend. One of the largest funerals which has occurred in Hampton for some time was that of Virginia Christian. The woman who was electrocuted in Richmond last Friday for the murder of Mrs. Ida Virginia Below. The funeral took place yesterday afternoon at 3 o'clock from the undertaking establishment of Charles Jones in North King Street. Reverend John Patterson, pastor of the First Baptist Church, conducted the services. The interment was made in the cemetery of the church. At least 1,500 people turned out at the funeral. There were also many white people present, but no unusual demonstration. Saturday night, from the time the body arrived until midnight, the undertaking parlors were crowded with the curious just to see how the woman looked, viewed the remains. Virginia had a smile on her face, and no effect from the electricity was noted except a slight wrinkle on her brow. She then went on to just exist through this one picture, erased at 17. Did she simply snap after years of bad treatment, or did she steal and was reacting to the accusations? Only Jenny will ever be able to answer that. Thank you for watching my video to the end. I love bringing these stories to life. It's literally one of my favorite things to do. Without you, I'd have no reason to do it. Thank you for giving me a purpose, and I mean that. See you next time on the Hillbilly Files.